MSNBC's coverage of the Michigan primary continues on The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. Thank you, Alex and Chris, for this mini election night coverage. We're going to return halfway to regular programming in this hour. A lot of numbers to look at on the screen, but it's another edition of The Last Word here. Have a Sounds great day. Thank you both. Thank you. Well, once again tonight, in the Michigan primary, President Joe Biden is getting a much bigger percentage of the vote from his party than Donald Trump is getting from his party. NBC News projects that President Joe Biden is the winner of the Michigan Democratic primary and that Donald Trump is the winner of the Michigan Republican primary. At this hour, Joe Biden has 79% of the vote and Donald Trump has 66% of the Republican vote. Let's go straight to Steve Kornacki at the big board for the latest numbers. Uh, yeah, Lawrence. So, I mean, let's start on that Republican primary because about a fifth of the vote, one in five votes, are now tabulated here. And you can see all the counties lighting up in Trump's color. I think the headline here on the Republican side, obviously, is that Donald Trump wins. But remember what Haley's been getting so far. In New Hampshire, she got 43 percent of the vote. In South Carolina, just last Saturday, she got 40 percent of the vote. She made that idea of 40 percent kind of consistently a centerpiece of her speech Saturday night. Well, here we are in Michigan that has the same rules that South Carolina had. There is no party registration in Michigan. Nobody registers as a Democrat, as a Republican, as an independent. Anybody who wants can vote in this Republican primary here. And yet some of the strengths that Haley had in South Carolina, some of the areas where she was strongest, that was able to bring her up to 40 percent statewide, and in fact, win a congressional district in South Carolina, the areas in Michigan that are most demographically similar to those areas, she's not performing nearly as well in Michigan in them. Uh, the, the biggest of the headline right here would be for Haley right now in Washtenaw County. Now, this is a Democratic county in the general election, University of Michigan, Eastern Michigan University. But I highlight this one because, first of all, so much of the vote is in in Washtenaw County. And second of all, because demographically, Haley has been appealing to voters who have college degrees, voters who live in suburbs, voters who have higher incomes. I mean, that is almost the definition of Washtenaw County. And yet even here, with more than 80 percent of the vote in, she's losing to Donald Trump by almost 10 points. This should and very well could be Haley's best county in the state. And there she is running at her total in New Hampshire. You see the same thing here in Oakland County. Two thirds of the vote is in. This is the big, big suburb, ju suburb uh, just north of Detroit. You got Oakland here, which is the white collar suburbs. And you got Macomb County here, which is the blue collar suburbs. This is expected to go. Macomb is heavily for Donald Trump. It was Oakland County tonight where Nikki Haley, if she was going to really get to that 40 percent level again, this would be the kind of county she would need to be winning. Instead, two thirds of the vote in. She's losing it two to one. And if those are the levels she's getting in what are supposed to be her best counties, well, look what's happening to her in, what, in counties that we knew would be her worst in the state. You know, basically, I say if you draw a line, we'll do it a bit arbitrarily north of Saginaw. You sort of start at Bay City, go north here. We expected just about all these counties to be heavily, heavily Trump counties individually. They're small. They're rural. They're working class. They have lots of white voters without college degrees. That is the core of the Trump base. And you could just see as they're starting to come in, these are the kinds of margins Donald Trump is racking up in them. 60 points, 54 points. Let's go to the thumb, 52 points right there in Huron County. So uh, collectively, these do add up to something, and they are padding Donald Trump's lead. And so what this adds up to on the Republican side here right now is Nikki Haley. Again, 43 New Hampshire, 40 South Carolina. She's under 30, and that number has been trending down. Because if you look at it, those counties I just showed you, Oakland and Washtenaw, which are supposed to be among her best in the state, they are disproportionately a large share of the overall statewide vote. Their, their sort of share of the vote is going to decline as these other counties that are more similar to those big Trump landslides I just showed you start filling in. In other words, there's a potential here this number could drop further for Haley, and there's a potential here this Trump number could go even higher. The biggest single outstanding variable continues to be this area of western Michigan. In the past, in the 2016 Republican primaries, this was Trump's biggest area of weakness on the Republican side. This is an area in general elections that has turned away from Trump and the Republicans in reaction to Donald Trump. So it's, it's a pretty big share of the vote. About 17 percent statewide is going to come out of this region. We're starting to get votes in here. Hasn't really changed in the last half an hour or so. But I think this is going to go a long way to determining, you know, if Haley is able to get back north of 30 percent 
or if that number, <coughs> pardon me, drops even further. Steve, what do you see on the Democratic side? And on the Democratic side, yeah, I mean, obviously Biden wins again, and the question has been uncommitted here. Two things on uncommitted. First is sort of a mechanical question with delegates. On the Democratic side, if you get 15 percent of the vote statewide, if you get 15 percent of the vote in any congressional district, you can start collecting delegates. Uncommitted right now running just under 15 percent statewide. Uh, but again, uh, take a look at Washtenaw County, because what I just said on the Republican side stands on the Democratic side. Big college county, University of Michigan, uncommitted is the, the vehicle for folks who are upset with Joe Biden's Israel-Hamas policies. Well, that has been, we've seen so much activism opposed to Biden on that front on college campuses in places like Ann Arbor. So you would expect this to be potentially the best uncommitted does statewide, or one of the best uh, locales statewide for uncommitted. Half the vote in Washtenaw County is running at 21 percent here, and there's a split within Washtenaw County uh, in Ann Arbor itself, where the University of Michigan is uncommitted to getting 32 percent of the vote. In the rest of the county outside of Ann Arbor, uncommitted is only getting 18 percent of the vote. And it, when it comes to this uncommitted question, the one big thing we're waiting on is within this county, Wayne County, this is the biggie, this is Detroit. But for our purposes tonight in trying to measure uh, uncommitted, the city we're keeping an eye on here is Dearborn, Michigan, population 110,000, majority Arab American, highest concentration per capita of Muslim Americans of any city in the United States of America. So we're waiting to see what the margin on that looks like within the city of Dearborn. But overall, on the Democratic side, you know, Biden here is running close to 80 percent. That number, uh, Wayne's going to have a lot to say about this, but that number could uh, track up a little bit. And uh, again, a question there, if, if there's a district maybe where uh, Uncommitted is able to pick off a delegate or two is really the, it's, you want to call that suspense, that's the suspense on the Democratic side. Steve, Steve, your coffee break time has arrived. We're going to need you later in the hour, but we're going to bring on a few more people to give you a rest. Thank you, Steve. You got it. Thank you. And joining us now is Simon Rosenberg, Democratic strategist and author of Hopium Chronicles on Substack. So, Simon, uh, on the Democratic side, uh, no one's bothering to mention it, but there is a human being uh, running against <laughs> Joe Biden. And that human being, who's a member of Congress, Dean Phillips, got so far has 2.8 percent of the vote. That is 10 percent of the vote uh, that uh, Nikki Haley uh, has gotten. Nikki Haley is at 28 percent as of right now, flirting with 30 percent. And so you, when you put Joe Biden up against an actual human being in the Democratic Party, that human being can get all of 2.8 percent versus Donald Trump, who, when he goes against a, a, a human being in the Republican <laughs> primary, uh, loses 30 percent and in previous uh, uh, primaries, 40 percent. And the question tonight uh, that we don't know, because there's no exit polls, you know, congr right. congratulations, exit poll business. They're doing nothing <laughs> tonight. So the only question that matters on the Republican side uh, of that primary is how many of those Nikki Haley voters will not vote for Donald Trump in November? And we have no uh, exit polling information to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, as you've mentioned, Lawrence, and we've talked in this show, I mean, one of the most remarkable statistics that we've seen so far in the election is these Haley voters in the three early states' willingness to not just not vote for Trump, but to vote for Biden. I mean, it's a big consequential event. But I will just say that if Trump got 60 percent in South Carolina and it was a romp and a blowout and is getting in the mid-60s here tonight and it's a big win, then Joe Biden getting 80 percent is a really big win, a really good night for Joe Biden. And, and I think that this idea that somehow this uncommitted movement would somehow alter the Democratic Party's trajectory, I think, hasn't happened tonight. I mean, remember that, you know, Barack Obama in just in 2012, when he was running for re-election, the uncommitted got 11 percent of the vote. Um, it's going to be probably 14, 15 tonight, really not a huge difference. And uh, Obama went on to win the general election against Michigan native Mitt Romney by nine points. And so I don't think things have really changed tonight in the Democratic Party. I don't think this was a good night for the uncommitted vote. It was a good night for Joe Biden. I will say that once again, and we don't have a lot of polling in Michigan, but the polls that were done in February had Trump above, you know, winning by 50 points or more. He's winning tonight by high 30s, low 40s. So once again, you know, based on public polling, Donald Trump is underperforming the public polls that are available to us. 
as he's done in the three early states uh, earlier this this election cycle. So what we've seen uh, since 1968, which was one of the fir first times we ever saw it, uh, yeah. when an incumbent president was up for re-election and someone within that party challenged the incumbent president. The worst yeah. thing that can happen for the incumbent president is that that challenger, that human being, get votes. Uh, that's what Lyndon Johnson saw in New Hampshire. Gene McCarthy got 42 percent of the vote. And Lyndon Johnson dropped out of the presidential race, yeah. not because he thought Gene McCarthy could beat him to the nomination. He was sure he would get the nomination at the uh, convention in Chicago, because that's where it was really going to be decided. It wasn't going to be decided by primaries. But the signal Lyndon Johnson got from that New Hampshire vote was, I can't win in November. This is too much weakness within my own party for me to win in November. Uh, and, and that's why, why he dropped out. When, when you look at this vote on uncommitted, which is, which is one that yeah. I fully respect strategically of the people who want to cast yeah. to, to deliver Agreed. this expression of this is, a, this is based on a policy that we care about. We think the president is failing us on this one policy yeah. and only on this one policy, on no yeah. other policy. Um, this is not a vote for a person. They could have put up a candidate. They could have gone to right. Dean Phillips. Dean Phillips says he wants a ceasefire. Right. He said in December he wants a ceasefire. They mm. refused, refused to vote for Dean Phillips. And they cast a vote that says to the president, we're not with you tonight. That's all that vote says. We are uncommitted tonight. And what I've been hearing uh, from the, uh, certainly from the politicians who've been leading that movement uh, in Michigan is none of them are saying they won't be with Joe Biden in November against Donald Trump. Yeah, and it's, we also have to be a little bit careful tonight in not exaggerating the role of a delegate or two here. I mean, I've helped run the delegate operations on the floor of Democratic conventions, and having a delegate or two is, you know, not a significant achievement. I mean, many times during presidential primaries that, a, you know, a cause or a candidate will pick up a few delegates here or there, you know, because there became a, a question of how much energy should the Biden campaign really put into this to deny the 15 percent? And they've made a decision that they could handle, you know, there being this kind of opposition of a delegate or two at the Democratic convention, given that there are thousands of delegates. right? And so, you know, the, I, I think it's just very important to recognize that to not exaggerate on our side the significance of what's happened tonight. I mean, I think obviously I also just want to say for the record that Joe Biden has been for a ceasefire. He actually negotiated a ceasefire. He actually is trying to negotiate a ceasefire right now. I mean, you can, and if you look at, you know, I just looked at the Economist YouGov poll from last week. Among Democrats, Biden's approval on foreign policy is in the, is in the upper 70s. His disapproval is in the low 20s. The party is with him on what he's doing. I mean, you can be for a ceasefire and still be for Joe Biden, you know, backing Joe Biden and what he's doing in the Middle East. This is an important discussion we're having in the family. We're not all together on this. And it's important that we air this out and continue the respectful debate inside the family. It's a tough issue. But I think this notion that there is some kind of huge backlash against Biden on this issue, I think, has been disproven tonight, actually not proven in my view. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I want to do both. I want I want to give that movement the yeah. strategic respect it deserves, especially including yeah. the decision not to put up a candidate, the decision to say, uh, we simply want to deliver this message at the ballot box. We're going to actively go out and vote and we're going to yeah. vote for a blank. We're going to do that as a way of expressing ourselves, which is much I, I don't want to say weaker, but it is a softer objection than going out there the way voters went out there for Gene McCarthy in 1968, because those voters were 100 percent against Lyndon Johnson when they cast that vote. And there was no way or, in the world they were going to vote for Lyndon Johnson in November. Right. Or Ted Kennedy uh, in, in 1980 mm -hmm. or some of the Haley yes. voters in this election. Right. It's, you, it's important, the distinction you're drawing here, which is that th this isn't there isn't an opposition movement of significance inside the Democratic Party. And I think this is, we can have a respectful debate. We don't have to agree on everything as Democrats. That's what a democracy is all about. This is a healthy debate we're having, as long as it stays respectful and we stay on the same team. And I think that, you know, it is, to your point, I, I, I take your point, Lawrence, right, that this was 
a, a thoughtful and serious way of addressing concerns about the Biden presidency. But I also think that I'm I'm proud of the president tonight. I think this was a very big win for him. And I don't think it really alters the trajectory of the Democratic primary in any way. But we'll see, right? We've got a long way to go, elections to come. Uh, and I'll be back here with you many, many times in the coming <laughs> months, you know, digesting what's going on. But I think that I, I go back to this basic reality of where we are. Since so, Dobbs in 2022, mm -hmm. right, Democrats keep overperforming, Republicans keep struggling. And it's why I'm, I'm so optimistic about what's going to happen this fall. And Michigan is one of the places where Democrats have consistently overperformed. Yeah. Simon Rosenberg, thank you very much for starting off our discussions tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Lawrence. And when we come back, Michigan voters saw billboards as they went to the polls showing a direct line from Alabama's in vitro fertilization ban to Donald Trump boasting about overturning Roe versus Wade, which made it all possible in Alabama. That's next. First of all, I've always voted Democrat. I cannot even fathom Donald Trump getting back in. I, honest to God, I get sick to my stomach just even thinking about it. So, yeah, just I got to come out here and do my uh, civil duty and vote. Voters in Michigan began seeing messages like this one on billboards today, proving that Donald Trump's boast about overturning Roe versus Wade is the only reason Alabama can now ban in vitro fertilization. Vice President Kamala Harris brought that same message to Michigan as part of her Fight for Reproductive Freedom Tour. Women have been giving, having miscarriages in toilets in our country, have been denied access to emergency care because of what has been happening. And then, as the governor said most recently, putting access to IVF at risk. So on the one hand, the proponents are saying that an individual doesn't have a right to end an unwanted pregnancy. And on the other hand, the individual does not have a right to start a family. The previous president of the United States then openly talks about how he is proud of what has resulted. Proud. The people of Michigan cannot sit back and take comfort without also understanding that elections matter and that there is a full-on concerted effort to pass a national ban, which would mean the people of Michigan would not be as safe. Joining us now is Democratic Congresswoman Hillary Skolton of Michigan. She was sitting right next to the vice president there. If we just had that frame a little bit wider, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, how much, uh, how important are the issues that the vice president was talking about uh, in what we're seeing in the results in tonight's primary? First of all, thank you so much for having me, Lawrence. It's an honor to be here uh, speaking on behalf of uh, the voters of my district. And, uh, you know, they were top of mind uh, for, for voters as they were heading to the polls. In Michigan in 2022, uh, we passed a historic ballot initiative codifying reproductive uh, rights into our state constitution. But voters here know that those rights could all be taken away if a Republican-controlled majority passes a nationwide abortion ban. And I, I talk to voters every single day for whom this is still a top issue for them heading into 2024. Uh, we're getting uh, different reactions from voters today uh, who did vote for Joe Biden. Uh, I want to listen to Andrea in Grand Rapids. I think the control room has it uh, almost ready or not. OK, never mind, control room. We were going to go to Grand Rapids because that's the uh, that's the district we're talking about here. Uh, the, the, what we were hearing from uh, from Biden voters today are concerns about the issues like this specifically and then stressing Joe Biden's experience and what they call his success in office. And so that that the achievement list of the Biden administration is something that we were hearing bits and pieces of it back from voters today. Yeah, 
it, it's absolutely true. And, and we see the evidence of it throughout my district, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law at work, replacing lead pipes uh, throughout my district, uh, investing in our airport. Um, and again, you know, policies that the administration has taken to protect women's reproductive freedom. It's on the record. And the contrast could not be clearer, especially in the wake of this Alabama Supreme Court decision surrounding IVF. Deeply personal issue to so many people. And you know what happens in Alabama is not going to stay in Alabama. The voters know this. Uh, 125 Republicans have co-sponsored a bill uh, recognizing a fetal right to life without an exception to protect a woman's right to make her family whole, uh, a family's right to make their family whole through IVF. And that, that's a bill that if it ever got to Joe Biden, he would veto instantaneously. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and Republicans in the Senate have also refused, refused uh, to even allow a vote that the Democrats in the Senate wanted to have on protecting in vitro fertilization. It's it's true. Uh, Senator Tammy Duckworth is expected to try to bring her bill up, uh, protecting uh, the right to build a family to the Senate floor. Republicans are saying they're going to block it. I'm a proud co-sponsor of the House's counterpart to that bill. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, that bill gets a vote, uh, including bringing it by a discharge petition if we have to. We're going to hold Republicans accountable to this. They're they're trying to backtrack now. Uh, you know, you can hear their tire screeches around the world as uh, you know they get their talking points memo from uh, the National Republican Party. Uh, but as the first woman and mother in history to represent my district, I don't need anybody to give me a memo. Uh, on on how to talk about women's reproductive freedom. Uh, this is a deeply personal issue. It belongs with the women and, and their doctors themselves, and not with these politicians in Washington who, who can't even understand the, uh, the basic biological concepts of, of how this works. It's been painful trying to listen to them, uh, you know, twist themselves into knots about how they can support these bills and also IVF at the same time. Again, we don't have to resort to hyperbole about these things. The, the facts simply speak for themselves. Uh, Republicans have voted against uh, women's rights, trusting women uh, with their own bodies, these critical decisions time and time again. And women are speaking up, especially even in places like traditionally conservative West Michigan, where I come from, uh, many voters voting for the very first time for pro-choice candidates. We don't know yet uh, how many uncommitted voters uh, there are in your district tonight voting that way. Surely you know them. Surely you've spoken to them. They've spoken to you. Uh, are they, are any of them or many of them telling you that they won't vote for Joe Biden in November? And what are you telling them? I'm, I'm telling them that the, the beautiful part of this democracy is that they have this process through which they can register uh, their complaints and their feelings. And I think, you know, that is one thing that we have, have seen in this process. This is, this is democracy at work. And, you know, I think the numbers will remain to be seen. Obviously, Joe Biden was the, the decisive winner uh, in the Democratic primary tonight. We are squaring off again uh, for a Trump-Biden rematch. And I think when voters are presented with that stark contrast of Joe Biden's record and Trump's record, Joe Biden's vision for America and Trump's vision for America. That contrast will uh, make sure will will just send voters rushing to the polls again for Joe Biden, as they did in in 2022, because we've seen the devastating consequences of a Trump presidency. And we know that a second term could be even worse. Congresswoman Hillary Shelton, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me, Thank Lawrence. You. And coming up, we'll get more of the numbers. But as of now, Joe Biden is headed to a much bigger victory in Michigan among Democrats than Donald Trump is headed for among Republicans in Michigan. We heard Republican voters in Michigan's uh, primary today explain their vote for Donald Trump by repeating Donald Trump's 2020 election lie. Michigan's Barbara McQuaid's new book, 
explains how Trump brainwashed those voters. Barbara McQuaid joins us next. I voted for President Joe Biden. Um, I feel that we need to continue the success, that we, the path that we are on currently. And also because we need someone who knows how to be the president, um, will keep us safe, will keep the people of this country safe, and will keep democracy safe. And do you have any concerns about another Biden administration? I do not. I feel that both he and Vice President Harris will be successful together as a team. Republican primary voters in Warren, Michigan, memorized Donald Trump's lie about the 2020 election and recited it earlier today. It was all rigged, I think. I think it was rigged with the ballots. I just know that everyone I spoke to voted for Donald J. Trump, and it was a lot of people. Our next guest, Michigan's Barbara McQuaid, writes in her new book, Attack from Within, How Disinformation is Sabotaging in America, that the Trump election lie, quote, provided justification for the coup attempt of 2020 and has given rise to the election denier movement, which remains in place to justify future anti-democratic power grabs. As of April 2022, fully 68 percent of Republicans, millions of Americans, were still under the influence of disinformation about stolen elections, despite the fact that congressional investigations, audits, and court challenges had turned up no evidence to support the claims. Joining us now is Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney and a law professor at the University of Michigan Law School. She's co-host of the podcast Hashtag Sisters in Law and is an MSNBC legal analyst. She is the author of the new book, Attack from Within, How Disinformation is Sabotaging America, which is out now and I'm happy to say in my hands. There it is. There's the camera. Uh, Barbara, the, what's so fascinating about this for me is is you get into a thing that I've just been thinking about vaguely and mostly in wonder. How do you get these people to believe this nonsense? Why can't they separate fact from fiction? But you actually get in here and show which wires connect to what. Yeah. So if you know, you look at history, what um, Mussolini and Hitler did, the tactics really haven't changed. Maybe the delivery mechanism has changed a little bit with social media, cable television, but the messages are very similar to the ones that we saw Hitler and Mussolini use. Uh, very simple messages, uh, you know, repeatable little slogans like stop the steal. Uh, what Hitler wrote about in Mein Kampf, make the lie big. Everybody tells little lies, but would not have the audacity to tell a lie about something so significant. And so the fact that the, tr the, the lie that Trump has told about a stolen election is so big that, ironically, it becomes more believable. So those tactics have been documented throughout history. The, and the thing that the reason why I always thought or thought we we could just assume away that part of uh, history is that. Those those dictators all controlled their their news media. There was no other voice in Russia than Stalin and the Soviet Union or in Germany than Hitler. But what we have here, what's happened is the voter has selected in a way to shut off all other information source and take the Fox propaganda and all the right wing and the Trump propaganda. Yeah, you know, we have now uh, sorted ourselves into news bubbles where we listen to one side of information or another on social media. You know, you heard that woman say, all my friends voted for yes. Donald Trump. I'm sure she is in a Facebook group with a group of people, and perhaps she watches Fox News. So all she ever hears is the repeat of these ideas of a rigged election and that the investigations against Donald Trump are voter in interference. Um, and so she lives in that ecosphere. So in some ways, you're raising a good point that it replicates some of those controlled medias of prior decades. How do you penetrate it? Yeah, I think um, a couple of ways. Um, one is we have to get people out of their basements and off the Internet and into the real world. We need to be engaging with people 
uh, on a human scale and not just uh, talking at each other online. Online, people are horrible. Mm -hmm. We are horrible to each other. We hide behind false personas or even just the nastiness that can be there when you're not seeing a human being face to face. So I think we have to see people face to face. I also think we have to understand that when someone has been um, duped, um, the last thing they want to hear is uh, how foolish they have been. When I was a prosecutor, we often dealt with uh, crime victims, people mm -hmm. who were the victims of fraud, and they felt shame in mm -hmm. having fallen for these things. So I think we have to show people grace. We have to ask them what is the evidence that they are citing and pointing to to reach their conclusions and try to help them see that evidence is necessary for us to reach conclusions. But I think we have to do it with grace um, and not with uh, dunking on people by telling them, I told you so. Michigan is one of the great places to study this since there's been, uh, you know, those people who tried to kidnap and murder their governor. There, there's been this outburst of the most fanatical kind of behavior at the extreme end of what this book is about. Yeah. And, you know, one of the points I make in the book is that how, how disinformation is creating dangers to public safety and the rule of law. And so when people are out there ginning up false claims, people become very angry. Why is this happening? Why isn't our law enforcement doing something about this? And so they become inclined to take the law into their own hands, which is what we saw with the plot to kidnap Governor Whitmer mm -hmm. and, and, and make a citizen's arrest. Or what we saw on January 6th at the U.S. Capitol, people didn't like what they heard and they thought it was so unjust that they were going to take the law into their own hands. And that's when things become chaotic and incredibly dangerous. Having studied this uh more closely than the rest of us have. Where are you in the hope versus hopelessness curve? Yeah, I, I worry that it's going to get worse before it gets better, but I do think there's hope. I think there are a couple things that we need to do. One is we need to change some laws and have more regulation in social media. We've allowed these giants to grow up, and in many ways, they've created wonderful, innovative products. But without any regulation, uh, they will d defeat us with artificial intelligence and all the other things. And there are some modest proposals there for regulation. But I also think that we need to persuade people about the importance of truth. I think some people have been duped by the lies that have been fed to them in recent years. But I think there are many other people who are willing to go along with the con because they are choosing tribe over truth. And so they want to align themselves with a particular party. And it doesn't matter to them what the facts are. You know, Donald Trump could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and not lose any voters. And I think he's right. And we need to care again that if we're going to have a democracy, then facts matter. Um how much of it is Donald Trump when Donald Trump goes away, which is either next year or four years from now? Uh, d does this does this thing does this stuff start to deflate? I don't know, but he certainly was the disruptor who caused it. But we now see a lot of people who have watched and learned his his tactics. I worry that the next one who comes along could be even better at it. But we see people like Jim Jordan in Congress, who is leading uh, uh, investigations into the weaponization of government, which is, of course, uh, just turning investigations on their head. We have seen members of the Republican Party try to impeach Joe Biden based on not just false in lack of information, but false information. And so I worry that now that this tactic is in their hands, that we can see other people try to wield it. Barbara McQuaid, great to have you here on Michigan's Big Night. Thank Thanks you very yourself. much for joining us. Barbara's book is called Attack from Within, right here. It is available right now. And coming up, we will get the latest numbers from Michigan and see how Joe Biden is still winning a much bigger percentage of the vote in the Democratic primary than Donald Trump is winning in the Republican primary. That's next. Paul Krugman, in his article, said he was going to vote, uh, his New York Times article said he was going to vote for Biden and there, he could give it the answer in two words, and they, they were Donald Trump. Uh, I think there's a better reason to vote for Biden. I think he has uh, has a continuing vision of where we can go, and certainly the vision that Donald Trump uh, purports to give is certainly not one I would buy into, and I don't think any other Americans should. And we are back on Michigan Primary Night. Steve Kornacki is still with us at the big board. Steve, is uh, Joe Biden's percentage, winning percentage, still holding? 
Yeah, it is. Uh, we can uh, go over to the Democratic side here. He's actually hit 80 percent now. You can see about a third is in on the Democratic side. It's been relatively slow tonight in terms of the pace of the, the vote returns. The state had been indicating that. It's kind of been a steady trickle, I would say. But um, the, the pattern is pretty much settled in where in most counties here, uncommitted is hovering somewhere around 10 percent. And then there are a couple exceptions we've talked all about. Uh, Washtenaw County, where Ann Arbor is, again, it, it, uncommitted, just over 20 percent right there, about half the vote in. The, the big sort of unfinished piece of the puzzle here in Michigan, the biggest by far, is in Wayne County. You know, like almost a quarter of the Democratic vote comes out of Wayne County. Detroit is the heavy hitter, but so here uh, is Dearborn, Michigan. We've talked about Dearborn with the majority Arab American population. And it's not just Dearborn. There's other parts around Dearborn in Wayne County, too, with large Arab American, Muslim American population. So that'll kind of, when, when we finally get fuller picture from Wayne County, I think that'll really answer exactly how uncommitted it's going to fall here. And if you look down in this area, there is a congressional district, the 12th congressional district, where it is possible, based on what we're seeing now, uncommitted might take a delegate. But otherwise, Biden uh, on pace here to win probably, or very possibly, all the other delegates uh, in the state. So you see Biden 80 percent there. Wayne County is the big thing. You just want to see if we're following the story of, uh, of uncommitted. Uh, on the Republican side here, Trump right now is sitting, you see, at 67 that Haley number, it's slow, but it continues to fall. We, we made a note when she hit, fell under 30. Now she's fallen under 28 percent of the vote. And again, about a third of the vote has come in here. The problem for Haley is the vote that has come in. I mean, the problem for Haley, obviously, is she's losing by this margin. But the, the thing she was trying to emphasize in South Carolina and New Hampshire was that, hey, there's 40 percent, she was saying, of the Republican Party in these primaries that wants to vote against Trump. Well, that's not what you're seeing here. And the problem for her is the, the votes from what were supposed to be her strongest counties. We talked about Oakland County. We talked about, for her, Washtenaw County. Places like that that have a lot of uh, college-educated voters, higher-income suburbs, places like that. She done very well there in South Carolina, very well in those places in New Hampshire. But she's really not hitting anywhere near those levels in those counties in Michigan. And those are supposed to be her best counties in the state. And also, those counties right now are disproportionately making up the statewide total. We, we, they are right now kind of punching above their weight in terms of the total vote, vote in the state. You can see all these blank gray counties here up in the UP. You know, they're small in terms of population, but collectively they add up. And Trump is getting 75, 80 more, 80 percent more of the vote in counties like this. So it's a long way of saying a third of the vote is in right now. But if you start to look at the pattern that's taking hold here, you see Trump at 67, Haley now under 27. I think it's possible Trump could move this up to 70 percent uh, and maybe over 70 percent before all the vote is in. And this Haley number could fall to about 25 percent or so. Um, again, there is a, a, an X factor here in western Michigan that we know outside of uh, those counties I showed you in southeastern Michigan. We figured this would be a struggle for Trump here based on the past. But even in, in this part of the state, look at that. He's at 61 percent in Ottawa. This was basically his worst county uh, in 20, uh, 2016, the last time he ran. So he, he couldn't end up. 70% is not impossible for him here. Steve Kornacki, thank you very much. Really Got appreciate it. it. Thanks. We'll be right back. All jokes aside, according to recent polling, this is a real concern for American voters. How do you address that concern going forward as you come up to the 2024 election? Well, a couple of things. Number one, you got to take a look at the other guy. He's about as old as I am, but he can't even remember his wife's name. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> number one. Number two... <laughs> It's about how old your ideas are. Look, I mean, this is a guy who wants to take us back. He wants to take us back on Roe v. Wade. He wants to take us back on a whole range of issues that are 50, 60 years. They've been solid American positions. And, um, and I really mean this sincerely. The, uh, I think it's about, about the future. And everything, every single thing we've done, I think we've got some good things done. Everything, and we, they told us we couldn't get them done because things were so divided. And uh, but I think everything everything we've gotten done, he's just friendly stated he wants to do away with if he gets elected. And I really think his views on where to take America are older than anyway. I don't want to get going. I mean, listen. Donald Trump is old. I mean, age is nothing but a number. I mean, I can tell you, listen, I'm 61. Do I feel it? No. Joe Biden is getting it done. Age is just a number. NATO is a bulwark against uh, Russian aggression. 
uh, and uh, he he was ready to walk out of that. There are other ways he he treated the people of Muslim uh, religious background. Uh, his uh, dirty mouth. Uh, I think he's pretty much an asshole, uh, to to coin a phrase, um, and it's terrifying to to me um, at 80 uh, to think that he would be one of the last presidents. Uh, he could decimate social programs that I've been committed to and worked on for a very long time. Uh, in, and so there's a whole variety, as well as his, his personal way of dealing with uh, people and the world. Any the latest uh, returns in Michigan show that Joe Biden is winning at this hour 80% of the Democratic presidential primary vote. Donald Trump is winning at this hour 67% of the Republican primary vote. Nikki Haley is taking 27% of the Republican primary vote away from Donald Trump. There are no exit polls tonight to indicate how many Haley voters intend to vote for Donald Trump in November, how many will refuse to vote for Donald Trump in November. President Biden has just issued a statement uh, following his win in the uh, Michigan primary, the unsurprising win, saying, I want to thank every Michigander who made their voice heard today. Exercising the right to vote and participating in our democracy is what makes America great. The president goes on to list all of the Biden-Harris uh, administration uh, achievements that he believes relevant to the people in Michigan, domestic achievements. And then he says, then President Biden says, for all this progress, there is so much left to do. Donald Trump is threatening to drag us even further into the past as he pursues revenge and retribution. He proudly brags that he is the reason Roe versus Wade was overturned in this country because of Donald Trump. Women's lives are at risk. Doctors face the prospect of criminal penalties for doing their jobs. And families desperately trying to have children are having access to fertility treatments ripped away. Now Donald Trump wants to ban abortion nationwide, including here in Michigan. That is President Biden's, part of President Biden's statement upon winning his now 80% of the vote in the Democratic presidential primary in Michigan.